Hello, my name is Georges Maliaras. I'm a professor of bioelectronics at the School of Mines in France. So I work in a laboratory that develops new technologies for bioelectronics in general. So uh, interfacing, as I like to say, between nature's most advanced creation, which is uh, human beings, and uh, humankind's most advanced engineering venture, which is uh, electronics. Uh, trying to interface those worlds is a bit complicated because we have mismatches along different scales. For example, in terms of mechanical properties, um, human body is mostly soft tissue, while electronics as we know them today are mechanically hard. Communication happens differently in our body than in an electronic circuit. Um, our bodies evolve, they change dimensions. When we're born, we're small, we get larger than we get. Uh, older, our metabolism changes, um, we get sick and eventually die, while electronics are stable, are, do not change as a function of uh, time. So interfacing these two technologies, if you wish, uh, means addressing those mismatches. So we use organic electronic materials and devices to bridge that gap. These are carbon-based semiconductors, and one of the uh, big advantages that they have is that they can uptake some of the biological media in their structure. Um, we make those in a solid form, in a solid film form, but when they're placed in contact with the biological environment, for example, when they're implanted in the brain, they uptake some of the cerebrospinal fluid. As such, they soften up and they make a good interface, mechanically speaking, between traditional electronics, which are hard, and the brain, which is soft. An additional advantage is that ionic carriers, which are the currency of uh, communication between uh, uh, neurons, can penetrate in these materials and couple intimately in the volume of this material with electronic carriers, which is the currency of communication in electronic devices. So this volumetric, this bulk coupling between the carriers enable us to make very good interfaces, both mechanically and electrically. The kind of sensors we work with are uh, meant to um, read out neural activity in an electrical fashion. So this is uh, called electrophysiology. We record electrical signals that are um, either the result of the activity of a single neuron or the results of the activity of a network or a network of, net of networks of neurons. Um, the information is used, for example, to localize epileptogenic zones. In cases of severe and intractable and pharmacoresistant epilepsy, uh, surgery might be an option where part of the brain that gives rise to seizures is removed or is burned by a gamma knife. And localizing that part is done to, uh, today using electrophysiology. So electrodes are being placed on the cortex or implanted deep in the brain and they record brain activity, trying to localize the, uh, the area where the seizure begins. Um, that's an example of recording. Another example of recording is before tumor resection, where uh, there is functional mapping of the surface of the brain done, so that uh, the surgeon knows um, if they can resect and how far they can uh, resect. Um, there are examples of stimulation where the probe is used to deliver electrical pulses and help, for example, alleviate symptoms of Parkinson's disease, such as the tremor. There are different programs in the US and in Europe for understanding the brain. Um, the one in Europe, which is the uh, older of the two, focuses on computational modeling of the brain, while the one in the US focuses on the development of new tools to interface with the brain. But despite these two differences, the community is, uh, the, the two communities talk with each other uh, quite a lot. Um, whatever we do in this uh, area uh, is decided hand in hand with uh, people who work in the clinic. Um, there are three parts on this research. There is the part where we understand the need. This comes mostly from the clinicians. They tell us we, it would be wonderful if we would have a device that could do that. Then we would develop that device. Uh, that part is mostly us. 
And then it's the validation part, which is done, again, in conjunction with the clinicians. So these three parts have to be done hand in hand with, uh, between the two teams. Otherwise, if you have just a group of engineers who goes off and engineers a system that might have an application in biology, that's a recipe for uh, wasting time and, and yeah. money. <laughs>